Simon said, my name is Njabul Nsibande. Um, I started trading a while ago, but I started really taking it seriously in 2020, and, you know, in the midst of the pandemic when we were all locked up in our homes. Um, and, you know, that's when I started my podcast, the Village Trader podcast. What I was trying to do then was finding commonalities between um, traders, both experienced and successful and beginning traders, I was having a bunch of conversations with uh, traders at various levels. Until ultimately I found myself creating some rules and that I would follow and I would um, share with you today. But really how I learned how to trade was through trading itself. Most of the learning experience that I've, uh, that I've had over the years was through the trading experience itself. And I found trading to be a game. I found trading to be a game and with every game, if there are certain rules that you need to follow in order to win the game and trading is no different. And this presentation is about such rules, right? But these rules that I'm going to share with you are not necessarily about where to which technical pattern to use. They're really more on the philosophical end of the of the spectrum in terms of as far as rules are concerned. There's no different, right? And there are many, many ways of trading. There's a whole host of trading um, strategies and methodologies that you could use, but there are very few that could work for you as an individual. So the journey into trading is about finding that straight and narrow path that leads into you that leads to that leads you rather um, into into success as a trader and the proof is in the pudding right because if you look at the success rate of of of, of trading only a few traders um make it out and, and and make it and make trading to be to be a success and well the question is how do we find that straight and narrow path well Rules is one of the way, or one of the important ways that we find um, that straight and narrow path, and this presentation is about that. So rule number one, this is a solo sport, so you have to do your own thing. A journey into trading is similar to um, a, a journey into individuation, uh, um, similar to when we were started in school, right? When we were started in school, we were young kids, we were a group of kids doing similar things as a group. Right, we we'll work up roughly at the same time. We we'll go to school roughly at the same time, and then we we'll get when we we'll get to school, we we'll divide into smaller groups. You know, friends, classmates, whether it's a drama class or debate or whatever. But in those group, we also do we get to um, group in, in into by by your own similarities with you with your group of friends. But until you get into the exam room, right, where the, your friends cannot write the exam paper for you. It's just you and you alone. And that you, you, your studying methods to be your own. They have to be in sync with you and your personality. And in trading is no different. When we start out, we start off trading with you know a bunch of strategies that we find on the internet, finding different ways, trying out different ways. And broadly speaking, we're doing similar things. We put on trades, we take off trades. Um, but ultimately to find to trade your own you have to trade your own way in order to, for you to find profitability you have to trade a style that's in line with your own personality and the reason why this is important is because you, you can't trade the way someone else's trade right because you are a different person and you have a different risk appetite than um, the, the than the next person and you have a different personality altogether. That's why you can't trade the way that they do. You can learn. This doesn't mean you can't learn from someone else. You should, and you can, because learning from someone else reduces the number of mistakes that you make, right? So you can learn from other people, but ultimately you need to trade a style that's unique to you as an individual, right? And how do we get there? How do we get to find that straight and narrow path for yourself? you'll find your own way for yourself. Well, you have to create rules and follow them. Don't just follow the herd. As I said in the beginning, it's okay to do what everybody else does because for the most part, doing what everybody else does does work. But you know, as you go deeper and deeper into, let's say your competence, that's where you, you have to you know, deviate from the herd, right? Um, rules are, essentially upfront decisions as the decisions you make beforehand how you're going to act before a situation 
um, it's deciding how you're going to act in a particular situation before that situation ha um, occurs. It's deciding what habits, what habits are you going to have, right? Who's, uh, in a sense, creating that solo map for you? Once you've separated yourself from the herd and you start to learning to do your own thing, you will inevitably, inevitably run into a different kind of a problem, especially in the beginning, especially in the beginning while you're still, um, you know, creating these rules and trying to follow them, you'll run into a conflict. You'll run into a difficulty following your rules, right? Which brings me to rule number three, resolve any psychological conflict emanating from you following your rules. Typically, a conflict arises between what you ought to do and what you'd rather do, right? And it's a similar process when you're starting trying to lose weight. For example, you know, remember those uh, New Year's resolutions, right? Me too. So in the beginning, you decide, okay, I'm going to go to the gym this time. I'm going to eat. Um, I'm going to put sugar. I'm going to eat well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in the beginning, that's fine. It works. It works great until that initial motivation wears off, and then yeah. it starts to 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 get difficult. Excuses starts to creep in because you, the, the the difference between what you'd rather do and what you ought to do or what you rather or rather what you have to do start to come apart right and it starts to get more and more difficult to do what you have to do to go to the gym right it starts to get more and more difficult to stick to that habit and then which is why we need discipline the word discipline um, is used a lot and it will be used a lot in, in your trading experience as you go further and further and discipline is what we use to resolve that conflict, right? So let's say now it's time to go to the gym, but I'd rather not go to the gym. I'd rather, you know, catch up on my on my favorite show or, you know, relax my, my, my legs because I'm tired or whatever the case may be. But I know I have to go to the gym. So I use discipline by saying, doesn't matter what, what, go, what, uh, what, what is going on in my life at the current moment because I had made a commitment to go to the gym, I'm going to the gym, you use discipline to force yourself in the beginning to stick to the habit until there's no difference between what you'd rather do and what you have to do. And what you'd rather do and what you have to do are the same thing. Now you get to that point where going to the gym is just a lifestyle. And you can use tricks in the beginning, well, you know, rewarding yourself with a treat, um, maybe something like if you go to the gym, you can come back and play some video games or something like that. You can just to trick yourself into that discipline flow until there's nothing else you'd rather do, right? That you know, you don't know, you no longer need discipline um, to go to the gym because that's just who you are. And for example, in, in trading, you know, in my own personal trading, I don't need discipline anymore to place a stop loss. I don't need discipline anymore to place a position in the correct position size. And I don't do this. I don't, you know, place a stop loss as I enter the trade because I'm a disciplined trader. That's just who I am. There's nothing else I'd rather do. And it, it was through this process of using discipline in, a, in the beginning because there was that conflict of, yeah, but what if my stops gets hit and then the market runs away from me or something like that? There was that conflict, but I used discipline in the beginning to resolve that conflict. Now, now it's just what I do. When I put in a position, I put it in the correct size. When I, you know, place a stop loss as I enter the position, that conflict has been resolved. Being a dis disciplined trader is just who I am. It's not something I'm trying to do. I no longer have that conflict. So we use discipline to resolve that conflict. And this is important to resolve that conflict emanating from you um, following your rules. Rule number four, this is a business, treat it like one. Many people come into trading trying to get rich by the weekend. And I suppose, you know, people go into business for the same reasons too. But it doesn't really work like that, particularly, in, you know, in the biggest casino in the world. You know, so I see you that um, it's not, it's good trading could be, could be taken as gambling, right? It's, it's the biggest casino in the world. But from, from your perspective as a trader, it's a business. At least if you're taking it seriously, it's a business, so you have to treat it like one. Right? And the number one objective of a business is to turn a profit, right? Which is the formula for profit is quite simple. Income minus expenses equals to profit or loss. 
And as a trader, our income is simple. It's profits that we derive from the trades that we take. And the expenses that we have are the losses that we get from trading. You know, there's, there's other expenses too, like, you know, your charting software, the data that you collect, the books that you buy, you know, webinars like this one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you have to drive down your expenses, particularly the losses that you take, which we'll, we'll, we'll get into. So as long as your income outperforms your expenses, you have a profit. That's your number one objective. Right. And your, your job as a trader in that business is to identify and execute trades and make sure that the income beat expenses, the, the profits that you make over, over a period of time beat expenses. And a good business person or a good businessman or woman also knows how well or badly his business is doing. And they know this through good record keeping. And as a trader, your record keeping is your trading journal, both quantitative and qualitative. The qualitative journal is where you record your thoughts, your ideas, um, what you, you know, thinking as you're looking at the market, whether you're looking, looking at the market from the fundamental perspective or from a technical perspective. And then the quantitative um, journal is, you know, the Excel part, the numbers, right? Your, you know, your entries, your exits, your profit or loss. Um, your R multiples, that all the statistical data that you collect as, um, as your trader is, is very, very important for you to understand whether the business is doing well or not. And the journal, the, one of the key uh, important things that the journal helps us with, it keeps us accountable to ourselves. It's like, a, it's like your own personal coach, right? If you say, this is how I'm going to trade, your journal will keep you accountable um, you know, will keep you accountable, uh, you know, comparing what you actually do and what you said you're going to do if you write it down. Because if you keep these ideas in your mind, you know, they will change in your mind and some of it you will forget. So if you have them in the journal, it'll keep you accountable. And, you, you know, um, it's, it's you, trading is a business. So you have to be strategic. You don't, you don't want to find yourself being just addicted to random rewards because they can come like that. So, it's a business, so treat it like one. Rule number five, learn to take some losses. You have to learn to take losses because losses are inevitable. They're just part of the game. Losses are the cost you pay to find your profitable trades. A mistake a lot of people make is that they want to avoid losses altogether. They try and eliminate this, their losses from, the, from their trading process. But that's like, that's like a box of thinking that you won't get punched because you've learned some ducking drills. And the problem with trying to eliminate losses is that it leads you to a different kind of a problem, right? It makes you sloppy. It makes you think that there isn't a risk in, in, in the trades that you take, right? That's like a, when, when a boxer thinks that he won't get punched because he's learned some ducking drills, he, 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 he's led to think that the risk of him getting punched in the face has been reduced to zero. And then he gets sloppy in the ring and that's when you get that knockout punch, right? And as a trader, similarly, if you think, if you take a trade thinking that there isn't a risk, a risk to the trade, or a, at least a risk of losing money to the trade because you've eliminated all the, uh, you know, you've eliminated, you've applied strategies to eliminate losses, right? And that's when you get caught, you're taking bigger positions because why not? Because you know you're not going to lose. So that's the kind of a problem that trying to get rid of losses will lead you into. It leads you into believing there isn't a risk to a trade and that leads you into slop trading, right? And, you know, people will go back to trades trying to figure out how they would have avoided, avoided any losses, um, et cetera. Let me save you the time. Let me save you the time. It doesn't exist. There isn't a way of trading that doesn't include losses. It doesn't exist. So don't waste the time trying to find a way that doesn't um, have losses. Just learn to take the losses. And more importantly, you can be profitable and very, very profitable without a 100% hit rate. In fact, you can be 
profitable with a low hit rate. In my trading, um, I, I, you know, between 2020 and 2022, I did about 120% return with only a 25% hit rate, which means I was wrong 75% on 75% of my trades. But I'm able to, to get that return because I've learned to take the losses and deal with them and not let those um, losses get to my ego or get to, to, um, to my state of mind, right? And the only way I could do that is to manage how I take those losses and how the, 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 the impact those losses have on, on my portfolio, right? And another thing that's, that's very important about learning to take losses, you need to learn to take a losing streak. Because you know, sometimes you run into a really, really bad market where you run into something like my long, my longest losing streak was like 20 trades in a row. Wrap your head around that for a moment. 20 losing trades in a row. Still have to do the same thing. Right? I still have to go back to the market and take trades the exact same way, even after 20 trades in a row. Why? Because I've learned to take losses and learned to accept losses as part of the game. Right? And how do we, what's, what, what, what the process that we use to, to, um, to help us learn to take losses? Well, brings me to rule number six, cut your losses, cut your losses. Right? As a business, it's important for you to manage ex expenses. And the biggest line item for you as a trader, as far as expenses are concerned, is the losses you get from your traders, from, from your trades. And you have to manage the damage the losses do to your portfolio because the, the losses don't just do damage to your portfolio. They do damage to your psychology as well, to your confidence. When you, whenever you're taking a trade, you have five possible outcomes. Are they gonna have a small winner, a small loss, a break-even trade, a big winner, which is what we're looking for, or a big loser? You, by all means, possible a big loss is what you want to avoid you want to avoid a big loss with everything you have as a trader and the way that you avoid that big loss is to cut them while they're still small right and here's what happens if you have been difficult to cut in losses while they're still small because you haven't learned to deal with them or to accept them is that they inevitably turn into a bigger loss which is even harder to take which then turns into an even bigger loss, which is then you are forced to take, right? Once you, you want to find yourself into a mother of all losses, your broker's gonna give you a, a margin call, right? And, you know, unlike the olden days, they'll just close your position because, you know, you've run out of money. And as a trend trader, it's, it, 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 it's, it's important to me because I have a, a low win rate to cut these losses short to make sure that those losses are very, very small because you know uh, um, they don't do damage to to um, to my psyche and they didn't do damage to um, um, to my portfolio, right? And how how do how do you cut losses? Well, there's two two important weapons that you have. Number one is a stop loss. A stop loss is a thing of beauty because it does exactly what it says in the sticker. It stops the loss from getting bigger. A stop loss is essentially a predetermined price that you, you said that you're going to exit the trade. It's like picking up the door as you, you know, picking up, uh, pointing out your exit door as you enter the room. This is where I'm gonna get out no matter what. So you're buying stock, let's say at hundred bucks, stop loss is at 90. If the market trades to 90 rand, you exit the trade, no questions asked. That helps to, to keep your losses small. It makes it makes it pre-commits you, especially if you place the stop in the market. There's various ways of um, you know, for example, you, you could say if the market closes below a certain moving average, only then it closes. But it's even better if you actually place the stop loss in the market and have the order in so that you don't have to re-decide mid-trade if you want to exit if you want to exit a trade. You can sleep well at night knowing that if the market goes against you, you won't be in that trade. 
And the second part of cutting losses short is your position size. How many, how many trips are you pushing of, uh, as a portion of your overall pocketbook, right? If I'm buying a share, let's say a 10 grand and I have my stop loss at 90, which means my risk per share is 10 grand, right? And if I buy one share, if the market goes down to, to 90, I lose, I, lose, uh, I lose 10 rand. But, but if I have 10,000 rand in my portfolio and I want to lose, I want, or only want to lose 2% of my account, I divide the 200, which is the 2% of 10,000, by the 10 rand, right? Which I can then buy 20 shares. That's my position size, right? That way, whatever happens, I know how much I'm going to lose on the trade. Of course, there's, there's other costs into the trade, like commission, brokerage, et cetera, and swaps and, and, and the like, which I won't get into uh, in, in this presentation. But I know exactly how much I'm going to lose. I know my position size into the trade. And with this combo, with this combination, stop loss and, and good position sizing, I never take a big loss. I've, I've eliminated a big loss from my trading process, which means at best, if I don't get a big winner, my small winners and small losses are going to cancel each other out and I'm going to remain flat, which is, worth, which is much, much better than losing um, a lot of money, right? So this combo right here, stop loss and a, a good position sizing will, make, will keep you in the game, will keep you in the game so that you are available for your winning opportunities. If at least if you can see them and take them. You keep because if 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 you if you take a big loss, you're out of the game. Even if you, the very next day you see the trade that would have tripled your money, you won't be able to take it because you would have been out of money. So cut your losses, cut your losses, cut your losses. Well, number seven. So after five, having avoided that big loss, of the five possible outcomes that you're looking for, the big winner is what we're looking for, and a big part of trend of what makes of what makes trend following a profitable strategy, at least for me, was getting these big winners. Now the question is how? How do we get your, um, these big winners? Well, basis of rule number seven, run your winners, run your winners, run your winners. Um, on the screen, you have an example of a trade I took a couple of years ago um, of, of an MTN trade. I took the trade at around 80, uh, 88 Rand. Right. Ultimately, I, exit, I exited the, the trade at around 175. If when I was taking the trade, you've told me to place a take profit target, I would not have placed it at 175. So by running my winners, compound my return, and having eliminated the big losses, my risk is still limited. Right. And as far as running your winners is concerned, there's two parts. There's the mental part and there's a practical part. And the mental part, you know, Dr. David Paul, who's one of the, 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 the best in terms of trading psychology, um, he, he, he said this, he says, the problem with most traders is that they're very optimistic with their losses and pessimistic with their winners. They hope that their losses will turn into a winner and fear that their winner will turn into a loss instead of, Instead, they should fear that the loss will turn into a bigger loss and um, the winner will turn into, uh, and hope that the winner will turn into a bigger winner. So you have to be pessimistic with your losses and optimistic with your winners. That's the, the psychological part that enables you to stay longer with your winners. And from a practical perspective, I want to quote um, Richard Dennis on, on, on market visits. He says, the correct way to approach this correct way to approach running your winners is to say, this structure means up and this structure means up no more. Never that this, up, this structure means up this much and no more, right? So that essentially means that you stay with your winner until it starts going the other way. And then you immediately let it go, right? Similarly with, with this MTM trade, I stay with the trade from, uh, from about 88, until it starts going the other way, right? And the way that I do this 
is that I have a stop loss on every single trade that I take. I have a stop loss because I have to eliminate uh, the possibility of a big loser, right? But I don't have a take profit target. And I want to emphasize this, this is just back to rule one, my personal style of trading. I don't have a take profit target, right? So I, I trade my stop loss behind me so that if the market turns, I am out of the trade. But if it continues to run, I remain in the trade. And then I raise it higher and higher, never lower. I always, always raise my stop loss higher. Rule number eight, pick what the market gives you. Don't be greedy. Well, in terms of finding winners, there's a limit to the madness. That's another people, uh, another mistake a lot of people make. They take the principle of letting your winners uh, run to feed their greed. And the line can be quite thin and gray. So what is greed? Greed is forcing opportunities that are outside of um, opportunity set. So for example, you were, you, you were an equities trader, you style only works on equities, but someone tweets about or brags about a big winning trade that they have on Bitcoin, and then you want to jump on the back wagon. On the, on, on the bandwagon, right? Or you have, you know, it's, 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 it's taking a, a, a trade on a side that your account cannot handle, right? Because you're sure the trade is gonna work so you, and you wanna double your money quick. So you take, the, you, you, you take the trade in big size and that sort of thing will clean you out, right? Or staying in the trade for longer than the market is offering you. Right, saying, I want to run this winner. I want to run this trade because it's a winner. When the market is turning, you don't exit because you're sure the market is going to turn and you want to stay with your winners. Right? If you take for the, you take for example, um, that MTN trade that we just looked at in the previous slide. When the market came to my stop, I didn't say, no, I'm going to stay in the trade because it's a big winner and I, I want to run my, my, I want to run my my winners. I said, no, cool. This is what the market is offering me, and I'll, you know, happily take it and, and move on, because that's in my field of opportunity. So, take what the market is giving you, and don't be greedy. Rule number nine: discipline and consistency are your friend. Right? Once, if there's one thing that guarantees you success in, in trading, and I suppose success in anything else. It's this combination right here, discipline and consistency, and they both feed off each other. You know, having applied discipline to resolve the conflict we, we spoke about earlier, you need to apply consistency at all times, not just when things are going wrong. Because what typically happens, people are disciplined and consistent when things are going wrong. So for example, people will take every trade that the system produces, while in the bull market. And as soon as things turn, they start chopping and changing rules because they're no longer now consistent because the environment has changed. You have to be disciplined and consistent in every market environment. And every, it doesn't matter whether it's a bull market, whether it's a ranging market or a, 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 a bear market. You have to be disciplined and consistent with, um, with what you do. Right? Because if you're going to act randomly, random inconsistent behavior produces random inconsistent outcome. If you want consistent outcome, whether it's losses or wins, you have to be disciplined and consistent. To guarantee success for you as a trader, as, even as you're learning, discipline and consistency are your true friends. Rule number 10, take full accountability for your, trade, uh, for your trading account and what happens to it. Going back to that first rule, you have to do your own thing and this is why. You have to take full responsibility of what happens to your trading account. You can't, you can't blame your broker, you can't blame your tipster, you can't blame the market itself, no one is fed, is chasing your stop loss, none of that stuff. You have to take full account complete accountability for what happens into your trading account because nothing happens in your trading account that you don't allow to you don't allow for um for it to happen right you have to take full responsibility of what happens into your account 
both the good stuff and the bad stuff. The oh, you can't just take credit when things are going well and want to shift blame when things are going badly. If things are going well, good for you. That's on you, man. And if things are going badly, that's also on you. Right? So take full responsibility of what happens to your trading account. Rule number nine, rule number 11, rather, you cannot borrow conviction. You have to build it through experience, right? You cannot read it, you cannot YouTube it, you cannot Google it, you have to old school grind it out. To take a trade and be accountable for it, you have to take it with courage of your own convictions. And more importantly, you need to have conviction and belief in yourself. You have to believe in yourself that you can do it, you have to you know, believe in yourself that you, even when you're still learning, have to have that conviction in yourself that you know you will learn you will get this right again you can only get that through experience you can read books you can read up some trading article listen to podcasts all that stuff is great for your learning process but the only way to do it is through is through experience which brings me to the last rule rule number 12 there is no bypassing your 10,000 as a trader, you can learn a lot, as I said, from books, podcasts, articles, etc. Right? But you learn how to trade from trading itself. You know, they say it takes 10,000 hours to reach mastery, but it doesn't take 10,000 hours to learn. You get to the 10,000 hours one hour, one hour at a time, one step at a time. You know, you know what they say about the, the journey of a thousand miles, right? It starts with one step at a time. For some of you, perhaps this power hour is, is that first hour. You know, be patient with yourself. Put in the hours, learn and grow. Now, I want to come to an example. An uh, example of um, a trade of a trend, trend following trend. You know, I went to a trading simulator to, you know, to retake that, that MTN trade in a sense. But, um, I've since, you know, changed rules on how I trade from a practical standpoint, right? So I took this trade, you know, in somewhere in March, mid-March, as, as that breakout happens here. And to understand, so the market was breaking a resistance as I was taking the trade. That's what triggered me into taking the trade. Now to understand support and resistance, just a little bit, just to, to tap on that, you have to understand how the prices move high and low. For a price to move from 100 Rand to 110, someone has to be willing to pay a higher price than what is quoted in the market. Someone has to be willing to say, them, okay, the, the stock is quoted at 100, and I'm happy to pay 110 rand. That pushes the market higher, right? So if you're looking at this, this chart right here, at these levels at around 76, no one in the world was willing to pay a higher price for for that period right but then all of a sudden someone said i'm willing i know that other people were unwilling to pay 76 um 76 rand 50 i'm willing to pay i'm willing to take the market higher that becomes important to me if someone is willing to pay a higher price that someone other people were unwilling to pay before that becomes a that becomes important. So I may not know why they do that, but I want to join in the party. I'm taking it. I'm taking it with an assumption that other people will follow him as well, and that will push the market higher. So I join in the party. But stop loss again. Stop loss says, if I'm right on this particular trade, where is the market? Where uh, will the market not go? Right. And for for this particular example, I looked at this candle here. I'm going to say if the market does will not take out the slow, the low of this candle, and then that's where I put my stop loss. If the market comes here, I'm out. No questions asked, right? So I place my stop loss around 68, and my entry was around 83, 83. So about roughly 20 odd rand stop loss. So lo and behold, the market rallied, and a similar thing happened, right? When the market got here around 90, no, the market said they were unwilling to pay a higher price and to push the market lower. But then a few, a few weeks later, someone says, I'm willing to go higher. If someone 
doubt that. I'm, re I'm saying at this point, I look at this as a new trade, but because I'm already in the trade, what I do is I raise my stop loss first. So in this particular instance, I raise my stop to about to, to, to around break even. So now, whatever happens on this trade, I can't lose money. Of course, commission and brokerage and the like, but from the trade itself, I can no longer lose money. So similar thing happens again, market says not higher, push the market lower. But when the market starts to disagree with that level and break higher, I again raise my stop loss. But now that first leg of the trade, if my stop loss is hit, I make money. So whatever happens, whatever happens at this point, I make money. So I now I can afford to take additional risk on the trade. So I can afford to take this new trade, right? So I take the trade. So now again, running my winners and adding to them, being optimistic with my winners. Similar thing, market says, nope, not a chance. We're not going any higher. Push the stock back below. When the stock dis disagrees, I raise my stop loss to a level where I say, if I'm right on this trade, the market shouldn't go there. So that's where I'm going to place my stop loss. Now, as you can see, the earlier leg of the trade is in bigger profits. And that last leg of the trade has um, a, a much reduced, reduced risk. And then and the, this cycle continues. Um, you know, if I raise my stop loss on that next breakout, both, um, the, uh, both legs of the trades are now in profits. I can add to the position. And then again, do the same thing again. Do the same thing as the market starts to break higher. I raise my stop. If my stop loss is above my last entry point, I add to the trade. If it's not, um, I, 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 I stay um, stay with it. Right, raising my stop loss, etc. Now my stop loss is at break even. The market says so. At this point, yeah, I was waiting for the market to break that 208 level, but the market says up no more. So remember when I took the trend, didn't say up this much and no more. But the market is saying uh, um, not not up any any longer, and then I'm happy to take the to take the money and run. And even if this trade was you know in the beginning this was a new trade, I still would cut my loss short here. At the loss, if if you know. Because here, and here's why, here's why you have to always cut the loss. When my stop loss was triggered there, I had no idea the market was gonna go as low as 107. And I can tell you to this day, it hasn't traded back up to that one, 179 level. I mean, one, that 175 as well, where I got stopped out. So this is why once your stop loss is hit, this is why, you must cut your losses short. Once the stop loss is hit, you exit. No questions asked because you never know. Well, your mind will, will take you back to the time where the your stop loss was hit and then the market really will charge you. But you will, you, will not, you will not, you will always forget these instances where your stop loss was hit and you were taken out the trade and it saved you a lot of money. You can imagine if I didn't exit this trade, how much money I would have lost if I said, I'm going to stay with this winner because it's a big winner. Right? With that, uh, ladies and gents, let's do a quick recap. Room number one, it's a solo spot. So do you have to do your own thing? Number two, create some rules and follow them. Number three, resolve any psychological conflicts emanating from following your rules. Number four, this is a business. So treat it like one. Number five, learn to take some losses. Six, cut your losses, run your winners. Number eight, Take what the market is giving you. Don't be greedy. Number nine, discipline and consistency are your friend. Take full responsibility for what happens to your trading account. You can't borrow conviction. And lastly, there's no bypassing your 10,000 hours. Some book recommendations. Trading in the zone and, and uh, the discipline trader by Mark Douglas, particularly trading in the zone. I consider this um, the Bible of trading psychology. I, I go through this as much as I possibly possibly can at least once every three four months you know i'll use an audio book so it, it makes it much much easier market wizards by jack with uh by jack schwager this book is a 
kind of like a podcast. There's a book where he interviews, um, you know, legendary traders. Uh, and there's plenty of them. There's market wizards. There's um, unknown market wizards, the recent one. There's hedge fund market wizards. So any of the market wizards book, it's, it's a great um, uh, 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 great read. Reminiscence of a Stock Operator by Edwin Lefebvre. Story about the legendary trader, Jersey Livermore. How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market by Nicholas Douglas. This is, a game, this is a, a book that changed the game for me as far as trend following and you know running your winners and you know um, adding to your winners, etc. And Annie Duke, this book talks about you know thinking and probabilities. It's a great book to to um, to read. But that, ladies and gents, thank you very much for the time. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be with me, and uh, I thank you very much. You can contact me if you want a copy of the slides. Jabula. Um, jabula.zibane at standardbank.co.za or jabula at villagetrader.co.za you can check out my website villagetrader.coza you can you know there's a box that i wrote there um and some old technical classes as well and you know someone said um at the top just on that but come for slash village trader where i write um a, a block about trading but it's intense thank you very much simon thank you very much for the time Jabula, appreciate. A uh, couple of questions coming through. A couple have already been answered. Your win ratio, uh, you spoke around that. We talked around stop loss examples. Uh, Josie's got a great question. And Jabula, I'll let you answer it first because I've also got some thoughts on this. Asking, uh, first saying thank you very much. How does one build confidence in their system? I feel whenever I'm doing, uh, whatever I'm doing, might not have the edge in the market for the long term. How did you build that, co that confidence? Because it is, I mean, as you correctly say, hugely important. But at the beginning, you know, you say to folks, make your own rules, and that's quite actually scary and 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 difficult to do. Yeah. So for me, it's it's just by trading itself. You have you build the the only way to build that confidence is through trading and through that discipline, right? And the question is, how 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 can I be confident in 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 this whatever trading system that I, that I'm using? that will be profitable in the long run is that you have to try it out and you have to try it out with discipline let's say for example you want to try out the moving average crossover system right um what the system is doesn't matter in order for you to build confidence in that system you have to trade it with consistency if the system says buy you buy to sell you sell but within that system you have to again with that trading journal that we spoke about you have to understand how much when it loses you money, how much it's losing you. When it's making money, how much it's making you. As long as on average, you make more than you're losing, you should be fine over a period of time. And you build that consistent, that, that confidence in yourself and in your trading system by applying it, by trading through it, while even when you have a doubt that this is gonna work, you still do what the system says you should do. And, and I think the best way to do it, at least in the beginning, is to find a mechanical trading system where you don't have opinions on when to take a trade or when to take off a trade. Everything is set in stone. You just execute. Um, so that helps build that confidence. And so obviously when you trade the system, um, for me, it was the laser system designed by Simon and the 721 as well. Um, there was no, I had no opinion on whether to take off a trade or not, but I had to follow the system. And in doing that, I was building confidence in myself in doing what I was said I was going to do. And then also just noticing how the market moves and recording patterns, um, you know, uh, subconsciously in my mind and having that confidence that I've seen this before, I've seen that before, I've seen that before, I've seen just experience. And that's a, a great answer, and Jibbul, and what you're saying there, it, it's almost less about confidence in the system. It's confidence about yourself. I, I concur with the mechanical system. In other words, a rules-based system. And I do think that the the way you really build that confidence is is is, is by doing and actually doing. I, I would add one point to it. And in fact, Mark Douglas talks about this. So you, you've you've got an idea. You're going to do a moving average crossover, or maybe the lazy, or a 721, whatever the case may be. Um, go to something like like Trading View, where you can go back in time and 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 sort of back test that system see how it works etc don't tweak the rules do it as you sat down with and if it's working and it gives you a positive uh, uh, EV well, then you can say well fine let me now in real time 
paper traders. In other words, don't use real money, just use a, a demo system, use monopoly money. It, it, it's boring and it's difficult to be disciplined because, you know, ugh, if you lose, it's not really money, et cetera, et cetera. But it helps to, in Jabula's point, sort of make you that discipline and improve you as the, the trader. And then that third step is then you start with real money. Now you've gone through a, a back testing process. You've gone through a paper trading process. Now you're at the point where you've got to put cash into the market and make that cash small. In other words, don't go and take your, your family life savings and put it into the market because that will stress you. Take a small amount of cash. You know, uh, in Jibula and I were fortunate during the, the pandemic, uh, one of the uh, uh, online brokers in South Africa was offering zero commission. Or maybe it was, I think it was zero commission. In Jibula, it was, yeah, it was free. Um, yeah, it was zero commission. Yeah, and, and that was just their marketing budget basically went to pay commissions for, for trade fees for folks like Njibula and myself. Um, and that means you can trade with a small amount of cash, not get killed by fees and minimums, and then slowly you build that number higher and higher as your as your, your balance grows from trading and as you add some some more cash into it. But uh, uh, absolutely, I think the, the key point you say there, Njibula, is that it, it's doing it. And that as much as we're building confidence in the system, truthfully, we're more building confidence in ourselves. Yeah, because it could change the system at any time. So the confidence in yourself yeah. first is more important. Yeah, that's a great point. It also means that you can then take the skill of trading, as you say in Jabula, and apply it to uh, uh, different markets, different assets, different uh, strategies. Um, you know, you, you can do different things with it. You've created the, the, the skill is not I'm a demon moving average crossover. The skill is I'm an excellent trader. And and, and that's really we we want to get to. And once you're an excellent trader, you know, now you can trade anything. It's it's like a you know a, a top surgeon. They they're, they're a top surgeon. They can they you know they might specialize in, I don't know, something or other, but they, they're a brilliant surgeon. They're great at stitching and all the other bits that go into it. And I'm gonna park that rabbit hole before it starts to get gearish. But you get the point from it. Um Folks, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, so we will park it there. Uh, as Njibula said, there are his contact details. You're welcome to give him a shout. Njibula, really appreciate your time this evening. That was excellent. Ladies and gents, appreciate your time. As Njibula said, you could have spent the last 50 minutes anywhere. You chose to do it here. Uh, we are both hugely appreciative. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers.